words. Um, we have Frank Savage, who uh, an enormously successful American businessman who has been involved in um, uh, the educational sector, entrepreneurship, has a book out called The Savage Way. Um, Peter Hessler, one of our, our great correspondents, staff writer for The New Yorker, uh, winner of a MacArthur Genius Grant, and uh, many other accolades. And Ian Baruma, who's very well known for books on everything from Japanese history to uh, uh, Islam in Europe and a host of other um, uh, uh, topics, all of them excellent. Um, so it should be a very good discussion. Um, I'm, I'm a few months out of the Obama administration, and I can attest that in the U.S. government today, you're really not allowed to whisper the word decline. It's one of the few things that gets you fired from a government job. So it's not the sort of thing we talk about, but when it does come up, you know, sort of whispered late at night, uh, we fall back on one kind of comforting thought, which is, you know, we've worried about decline before in the U.S. We've been through this before. We worried about the Soviet Union passing us. We worried about Japan in the 1980s. And every time, this fear of decline has forced us to get our act together, and we've come out on top once again. So, Ed, let's start with what, what may be one of the um, more, more distressing uh, arguments in this book, which is that that has been true in the past, but this time really will be different. You don't think we have uh, the same capacity to snap out of it this time. Why? Um, that's a very good question, a very germane question. A lot of the reaction in the States to my book has been precisely that. Is look, we faced, um, we faced Nazi threat, we faced Great Depression, we've had a civil war, we've had the rise of Japan and the Soviet challenge, Sputnik. All of these we've overcome. Um, what is it about today's situation that, that, that makes us less American and less pragmatic? And my answer to that is Pearl Harbor, Sputnik, even Japan's rise were all unifying events. They produced bipartisan responses. And, and you need bipartisanship, as you know, with America's separation of powers in order to have any effective action um, at the federal level. Um, in contrast, the problems we're talking about today are much more subtle, are much more slow-moving, are much deeper, are much more structural, to do with globalization, to do with technology, and the effect that changing, exponentially changing technology and exponentially integrating globalization is having on the ability of most Americans to earn a living. Um, we're four, three and a half years now into the recovery. It began in June 2009. With each successive year, um, the median income, uh, the median, the middle class income um, has declined. It's declined now about 8% since mid-2009. This follows on from the uh, 2007, 2002 to 2007 business cycle, the first in America's history, um, where the middle class income was lower at the end of it than it was at the beginning of it. Um, and then, of course, there was a deep recession in between which really hit income. So the net result is we've got a progressively and acceleratingly declining median income, um, a, a hollowing out of the American middle class, a polarization of the economy that has its analog in a polarization of politics, which is paralyzing the system. It's as far as possible as you can get from the kind of shocks, um, the Sputnik, the Pearl Harbor shocks, that produced unified responses. Uh, Washington remains paralyzed um, in, in, um, in dealing with these challenges. And that, that's really the source of my pessimism. It's a governance paralysis um, that America is, is trapped in. And I see little sign of, of it emerging from that. Frank, um, let, let's go to you. you um, Ed writes at one point that the, the American escalator has come to a halt, and you are um, you write in your book about being a product of the once great American meritocracy. Um, you, you've been a champion of it in various ways. And there are all kinds of studies showing that while America thinks of itself as a place where uh, anyone can rise to the top as the land of opportunity, that's just not true anymore. It's not true in the way it once was. What's, what's going wrong, and how do we fix it? Sorry about that. When I first picked up Ed's book, and I looked at the title, Time to Start Thinking, America in the Age of Descent, I have to admit, Ed, that I tended to focus on the word descent. But as I read through your book, I, I realized that you actually had done us a service. That is, Americans like me. And, you know, we have a lot of self-confidence, and we believe in ourselves. But what you've done is that you have shed a very bright light 
on some of the things that we ne necessarily must address, and we need to address them very, very quickly. So thank you very much for that. At the same time, I will say that I still believe that America will end up, at the end of the day, uh, being a strong country. Now, if we have to share our position with other countries of the world, I welcome that. I don't see anything wrong with that. India, China, South Africa. I think we welcome the ability to share the responsibility in the world which we inherited after the Second World War. Uh, and everyone could always look to America to stand there ready to keep the world going. I think that we would welcome that because quite frankly, you have pointed out a lot of symptoms of malaise in America, economically, politically, and morally. But the question is, is the sickness terminal? I think not, but I will admit that if they're not treated quickly, they could be. Now, the most troubling symptom that you pointed out, and by the way, you did a fantastic job of pointing out so many shortcomings and problems that we have, but the one which disturbed me the most is the one which I believe you just alluded to. That is the decline of mobility in the United States and the widening gap between the rich and the poor. Now, you say in your book, quote, since the American Republic was born, equality of opportunity has been at the core of the American way. And that's a fact. Presidents like Lincoln, Roosevelt, Lyndon Johnson, they made mobility and building a middle class the core of their administration's policy. Now, Barack Obama, with his re-election, has an opportunity to join the ranks of the great presidents of the United States, make a real quantum change. The question is, is he up to it? The question is, is the governance structure that we have in the United States now broken? Are people so intent on getting their way that compromise is no longer a possibility? Now, in my memoir, The Savage Way, I, I recount how my mother we called her Madame La Sauvage. She was a very successful businesswoman. She migrated from North Carolina to Washington, D.C. with my twin sister, Frances, and myself in search of opportunity for us. She never took a penny of money from the government, but without the underpinning of the government infrastructure and the government's job creation ability, she would never have been able to be successful because the clients would not have had money to buy her products. But she had self-confidence and she had that underpinning, that infrastructure from the government. Governments have a role of creating an environment that will enable their people to improve themselves. So contrary to what a lot of people in the Tea Party say, contrary to what a lot of really, really super rich Americans are saying, I think they're being very disingenuous when they say to people, I've got mine and you've got to get yours. You know, they don't know how much they have benefited from the government. I've been on many, many corporate boards, I've worked at many, many universities, and I can tell you without government help, we would never have gotten where we are. So I just wanted to say that I think you're right to, you know, pull our coattails and say we need to get our act together. Let's go to a, a kind of counterpoint to the, the role of government. Um, Ian, a, a, a lot of people argue that this dysfunction, this stagnation has caused America to become much less of an open society, to become less welcoming to, to immigrants who have really been the kind of source of our resilience and our strength through these uh, other, other bouts of declinism. Um, do you still see America as an open society? Does that give you hope for, for renewal? Yeah, I, th I think it still is an open society. In some ways, of course, it's true that, the, that large sections of the white middle class are relatively doing worse. There's no question about that. But in some ways, the resentment that they feel, uh, that fuel the Tea Party and that kind of thing, is also a, a sign of, of successful mobility of others. I mean, one reason there is such rage among some white Americans is that they see Latinos, Asians, Nigerians, Indians, and so on, doing very well in America. And that traditionally has been the strength of the United States. And it's just that the old white whites who thought they were in charge and they only 
they feel that the country is slipping away from them. It doesn't necessarily mean the country is in terminal decline or even in, in real serious decline. What could, uh, in my view, uh, cause serious decline, I think the great danger is if the United States or Americans, too many Americans, give in to another strand uh, in uh, American history, uh, which is to give in to fear of the outside world. And after all, a lot of people immigrated to, or emigrated to America because they wanted to escape from a bad old world, and America would protect them. And so the idea of the bad world uh, strengthened after 9-11 leading to people it getting harder to get into America, harder to get student visas, less interest in the outside world, and so on and so forth. If that were to become a serious issue, and, the America, and America were to close, not entirely close its borders, but not be as welcoming to people from the outside who want to make it, as it were, in, in the new world, that would be a serious problem. Peter, you are, of course, in America, but you've spent much of the last um, couple of decades outside the United States and China and now, now in Egypt, uh, both of which loom very large in the American imagination right now. Um, from, from the vantage of these, these, these other countries, how does American decline look? And, and especially, do you think the model, is the American model still appealing when you talk to young Chinese, when you talk to young Egyptians? Does America still represent the beacon that, that we in the United States think it is and think of as a sort of great strength? Um, I, I think uh, I think in Egypt now there's a lot of resentment about America and there's a lot of suspicion of America. I think in China people tend to still look positively on America. Um, I, you know, sort of going to what Ian said. I mean, one thing that living in China in particular taught me was that, and then moving back to America for a period after living in China, is I, I came to realize that fear that he mentioned and also sort of a flexibility. These were things that I admired about people in China that I felt like Americans had slipped a little bit in that the Chinese adjust very quickly to change the situations of this generation. And, and they tend to be pretty fearless. You know, they're not afraid of downturns in the economy. They're not afraid to get up and move. Uh, you know, people switch jobs all the time. They switch skill sets. They, they, they find ways to train themselves to learn new things. And, and I, I really admired that quality in China. And I felt like that's something that Americans, you know, and, and this is natural. I mean, when you've been a pretty prosperous society for a while, it's easy to lose that. And, and, and the Chinese are coming out of a period of you know, poverty and, and isolation, and, and they're hungry for the opportunity. And, and I think that's one thing that, that I felt like Americans could learn from China. Um, I, I think the Chinese are, you know, most Chinese don't see their country as a finished product. They don't see that as a system that is fully functional. They don't believe they found the solution. You know? And I think actually from the outside, we tend to, to think of China as, as, as more powerful and and more with it than the Chinese do. Most of them are quite aware of the weaknesses of their own society. Ed, do you want to respond to um, any of these cases for optimism, especially the, the, the openness of American society and what that could be? I'll pick up on a couple of things. Ian, what, what you mentioned is a very good point um, about there is a white element to this, uh, fueling the Tea Party, and essentially now, nowadays in control of the core of the Republican Party. And um, unfortunately, because there's a super majority system in America, that, or in other words, there's a minority veto built in, you need a 60 vote uh, majority in the Senate, for example, to get anything done. Unfortunately, their decline in, in demographic terms is going to take quite a long time. We've seen California paralyzed, uh, really, in terms of its governance for the last quarter of a century because the Republican Party, the Anglo Party, which is what it's become, has, has been blocking any sort of form of effective government. So the public university system, the famously, justly, uh, for, for purposes of comfort in terms of federal, the federal system. 9-11 and fear is such a huge factor. Uh, there's a lot of talk at the moment that Obama can push through immigration reform. I hope he'll be able to. He will need Republicans to support him in order to do it. But I, I, my sister-in-law, um, my, my Indian sister-in-law, lives in Palo Alto, in, in, uh, on the West Coast, um, in Silicon Valley, and so I and we go and stay with them a lot. And um, I, I get sort of first-hand accounts of Indian students and Chinese students and other students who, before 9/11, would have got visas uh, having graduated, and since 9/11, in the famous words of Farid Zakaria, your 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 immigration officers in America are far more scared of letting the next Mohammed Atta 
into the country that they're actually block blocking the next Bill Gates from coming in. So, so the, the Indians and the Chinese are going back on a scale they weren't before at a time when they have opportunities back home that they didn't have before. There's a scissor effect here that is cutting out the human capital that is at the heart of Silicon Valley, that is at the heart of the entrepreneurial spirit there, um, that, that is based on the fear Ian was talking about. Final quick point um, in response to, to, to what Frank said. Absolutely right. I think the role of government in lifting up the middle class in the United States um, has been fundamental. The role of government in building the American economy, in building Silicon Valley, in creating the internet, in creating all the kinds of innovations that we take for granted, our private sector in innovations, were huge, had huge public roles um, in, um, involved in them. This is the kind of thing that is now um, uh, very, very difficult to push through in Washington, D.C. So we're having declining research and development budgets. We're having um, stasis or paralysis on immigration reform. Um, no, no infrastructure um, uh, spending. America's rapidly descending into a second world infrastructure level. Anybody who um, you know, looks at the power grid or travels through American airports or experiences the slow speed of the internet will, will agree with me on that. All of this requires government to be functioning. If government is not functioning, um, then this isn't going to be rectified. And so I would strongly underline what Frank, what Frank said. The escalator, the, the social mobility escalator, um, has broken down in the United States. Um, and to get it going again, I mean, your chances of moving up a class in America, up an income bracket, are lower now than in any other developed country, including Britain. And Britain's not a good country to be lower than in terms of class immobility. Equality of opportunity is the foundational creed of the United States, and it's doing worse than everybody. That's, that's an alarm signal. And, and I, you know, people are hearing it, and Frank put it very eloquently, but people aren't hearing it loudly enough to change the way they do business. Yeah, in order to have a sustainable economic recovery and to open up the doors for people who are been less fortunate than some of us sitting around this table, I think that the president has to find a way to break the roadblock. He has to solve the short-term problem of the roadblock in order to be able to address the structural problems that you talked about on research and development, on education, on transportation. I think that his strategy now, having seen that his efforts to try to talk to the Republican parties and extreme right wing have not yielded results, He's taken a much more aggressive stand in this term. He's decided two things. Number one, rather than trying to sit down and debate, he may send Joe Biden over to debate, but he's going to be out talking to the American people. Because they have already said in the vote that they share his concept of the United States, that the most important thing for us to do is to provide an opportunity for this middle class to grow and respond. Small business to grow and respond. They, they're the ones who create the jobs. Big companies, when there's a crisis, they do what they think they have to do to protect the shareholders' interests. They cut back on hiring. They cut back on de, uh, investing in capital equipment. The, the middle class is always growing. So he's got to find a way to reach to the American people, go to them, and get them on his side. And I see some signs that that strategy is working. The fact that recently the Republican Party came out of, a, of, out of a meeting that they had and decided not to just draw the line in the sand on the debt ceiling, to give them another three months. Now, they have said that they're still going to stick to their requirement that there be savings. But the fact of the matter is that they're showing signs of weakness. I don't want to say weakness. Maybe a more appropriate terminology is to say they have looked at and analyzed the vote. And the vote tells you that Americans it's not so much between white and black anymore. It's really between the haves and the have-nots. That's the big issue, the haves and the have-nots. And I think that he will be successful. It's going to be a real challenge, uh, but I think he's going to be successful in that strategy. Can, can I add a couple, a couple other uh, data points you should respond to? I mean, the, the coalition that, uh, that re-elected Barack Obama is the people that Ian was talking about. It was not the angry, uh, angry old white, white men and women 
it was immigrants, it was, it was youth, it was uh, single mothers. Um, that has given him a different kind of political mandate. And there does seem to be momentum behind immigration reform. Um, Amer America is now roughly energy ind independent and will no longer be um, dependent on imported oil, and, and that will give it a certain amount of resilience. Um, there's, uh, we've seemed to have sort of worked out our budget situation. California has passed a tax increase for the first time in decades. Um, this seems to cut against some of the pessimism and has to offer at least some cause for hope, but I gather this hasn't uh, undermined the thesis of your book, in your mind at least. Um, no, you mentioned several things there. The assumption is, the assumption is immigration reform will happen. I hope it does. Um, I'd like to see what shape it takes before agreeing with you that that's a point of optimism. Um, California has passed a tax increase. I think I've dealt with the, the California subject. The federal government hasn't. Um, Frank's right, the Republicans put off their hostage-taking threat with the sovereign default to May. The fiscal cliff has been put off till March the 1st. Um, my betting is they're just going to keep kicking that can down the road because there isn't going to be bipartisan unity. Um, the only point of agreement between the Republican and Democratic Party in terms of fiscal reform has been to cut that fifth of the American budget um, that's the domestic non-defense discretionary, and that includes R&D, infrastructure, education, worker training, community colleges. It's the tomorrow portion of the American budget. The other bits, defense, which is a much larger share of the budget, entitlements, th these are the yesterday portion portions of the budget, and there's pretty much consensus not, not, not to cut them. I don't think there's going to be any entitlement reform um, coming out of 2013, and I don't think defense is going to get hit. What will be hit is the tomorrow portion of the budget. So the fiscal picture in, in, in Washington actually reinforces uh, my pessimism. This is not a pragmatic way of, of, of making policy. Let's um, flip, flip this around for a second and look at this question from, from outside of America rather than um, uh, just through the lens of American policy. Now, one of the things that's, that's in some ways most, um, most difficult about your book from an American perspective is that you really do seem to have sympathy for the American project. Um, sometimes when people talk about American decline, it's with this almost lethal tone, and you really don't get that um, in, in, in your book. And in the, in the U.S. government, when we talk about decline, um, the other kind of comforting fact is, well, who's going to replace us, and what's, what's that world going to look like? And you know, kind of want to say to everyone else, well, you thought America to Germany was bad. Just wait till you get what's coming next. Um, and and I'm not exactly sure if that provides comfort exactly, but um, you know, kind of puts, lets us sleep at night if nothing else. So um, may, maybe we go to Ian, Peter, who have a um, much more of a kind of agent perspective on this. What does this mean for, if America is in decline? What does this mean for Asia? What are the prospects for uh, the Chinese position in the region given? these changes that, he, that Ed writes about. I mean, I think part of the one thing I always think about when, when I hear about America's decline is, is what's the alternative, you know, and, and the alternative that most people mention is China. It seems obvious to most people that this is the country that's on the rise, and I feel like China is very impressive from the outside. It's very impressive when you go in for, for a short trip. It has, you know, the infrastructure is amazing. I mean, there's no, you know, every time you go back to America from China, you're really struck by that. Um, and you know, all the new trains and new roads. But when you live there and you sort of see how is this happening, I, you know, you, you have, it feels less powerful less, and less functional, basically. I mean, let's look at the, at the infrastructure. You know, where does the money come from is a really important question. How, how, do they, how do they fund that in China? Because most of it's not top down. It's mostly from <coughs> municipalities, from cities. They have a very weak ta tax base. They can't issue municipal bonds like the U.S. But what they do have is a very strange legal system that has been a holdover from the communist years when nobody could own land. And in the late 80s, they reformed that so urban people could basically buy and sell land use rights on the open market, but rural people can't in China. So what governments do is they acquire rural land, which they can do at their own will, and they don't have to bargain for it. They just pay a fixed rate. And then they take the land, and then they resell it on the open market. And that's, you know, I did a case study in my last book of a 16-acre plot outside of a small city. They paid a million dollars for it, and then three years later, they sold it for $37 million. And if you're doing this across China, it's a huge amount of money. I mean, and one of the top economists of the Academy of Social Sciences told me she estimated about 50% of their municipal funds come from this buying rural land and selling it. And, you know, that's, and she didn't know for sure because it's not on the books. 
you know, and, and it's sort of, that's a very problematic situation because it, it can build a bubble very easily. It also makes rural land much more functional because people don't invest in it if you don't really own it. Um, and not to mention that it's not fair. I mean, this is 750 million people who don't really have property rights. That's 55% of the population. You know, you know, America would have a great infrastructure too if we could just take land from people and then resell it, you know, for a profit. And you just, you know, so eventually that's going to have to change. And as people in China become more educated, as, you know, and there's lots of pressure against this as it is, they know they're going to have to change that. And when they change that, they're going to have to find a new in income system. They're going to have to have taxes. That's less popular with people. They're also going to have fewer rural people who are pushed off their land and who are willing to work for a quarter an hour in factories. It's going to change their manufacturing immensely. So there's a lot of very, and you can look at many segments of Chinese society and see this kind of weakness. But yeah, I think when you go in quickly, you just see these new roads and it's amazing. And the Chinese are aware of this. You know, they don't, they, they don't feel like this is a long-term functional system. They don't feel like this is the answer. So I don't really see that as the alternative to America. So I do feel like America is in a tough period, but I think China has a lot of tougher periods on the horizon. China is not going to take over as a world power, partly because nobody wants it. I mean, not the Chinese themselves. No, it won't be uh, perhaps even the dominate, dominant power it perhaps would like to be in Asia because none of the other Asians want that. The Japanese don't, the Koreans don't, the Southeast Asia, Asians don't, and certainly the Indians don't. So I don't think it'll replace America, but that's not necessarily, that doesn't solve the problem. And one of the reasons um, I think that we shouldn't be gleeful about American decline is that we're also dependent on America. And that's true in Europe, where since the war, America has basically um, maintained security, uh, which has made Europeans rather like adolescents um, wanting to sort of kick their father in the shin all the time, even while, while they're being protected. In East Asia, everybody wants the United States to remain the policeman because the alternative is that the Japanese would do it, which the Chinese don't want, or the Chinese would do it, which the Japanese don't want. But it's not really, this dependency is not really good in the long term, either for us in the rest of the world or the US, because it's too expensive for the US, the will, the political will in the U.S. To, do, to continue to do this will decline. At the same time, it means that in one area, at least, even as airports and so on crumble, the U.S. really is vastly superior to the rest of the world, and that's in military might, with which you can't really do very much. But what you can do is what the British tended to do in, in the beginning of the 20th century when they too began to decline in relation to, say, Germany and, and the United States is to use their military might to sort of blunder around the world, uh, partly as a distraction from domestic problems, and partly under the illusion that they could somehow shape the world constantly to suit themselves. And we've seen in recent history where that leads. That, um, China, at the beginning of this century, 12, just 12 short years ago, the United States had about a third of world GDP, just under a third. Um, by IMF measures, it's now just above a fifth. Um, now, the growth of others, the rise of others in economics is a good thing. It, economics is not a zero-sum game. More Chinese becoming literate, more Indians becoming literate, expands markets, mutual opportunities. Geopolitics is a zero-sum game. And I fully agree with everybody's sentiment here. China is not the coming replacement for America. Um, there is no hegemon waiting in the wings. China, America's power has been its ability to build global alliances, not just its military, but its, su uh, its support amongst, from other countries. China doesn't have a single treaty alliance, and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So I don't, I don't share you know, some people's view, not on this panel, that China is... Um, I, I have a, a, more, a more worried um, perspective, which is that nobody's going to replace America, and America is not strong enough to build a system to refurbish the multilateral institutions in order to accommodate a rising and potentially threatening China. Look at Afghanistan. Um, next year, Barack Obama will leave maybe 2,500 troops there if Hamid Karzai agrees. Maybe he'll leave none. The recent talk is none. Um, Afghanistan's got something like a trillion dollars worth of estimated rare earth, rare minerals, lithium, all sorts of extraordinary um, uh, economic potential in its ground. 
America has been there 12 years. It's the longest war in its history. It's spent hundreds of billions of dollars. It's a country of 15 million people. It's medieval. America is leaving it no better off than when it found it. After 12 years, China is poised to scoop up a lot of these mineral concessions. Now, America's ability to impose its will um, is very, very diminished. Um, and it's a vacuum that I fear. It's not that China is going to become a stable global hegemon. It's that nobody is. Just, just one thing, just to pick up on Ed's point. Uh, I think that uh, you're right about America is uh, losing the ability to enforce its will. And I would say this, that fewer and fewer Americans want to enforce their will. They think that it's time for America, after 14 years, as you say, 12, 14 years of fighting the wars in Iraq and, uh, and in Afghanistan, they want to turn their attention to solving some of the core problems that you mentioned, because we're very much aware of these shortcomings. We're very much aware of that. So we have, to, we have to get out of the, I mean, I think that if we get out of these wars, what's going to happen is that the balance sheet of the United States is going to begin to change. Right now, we have a deficit. We're borrowing heavily uh, because we're spending trillions of dollars on the war, and we're trying to also build our country up. So we have, to, we have to make some changes. Now, I will say this, that while we may be disengaging from the Middle East, I think there's, there's, a, t there's a desire to increase our engagement in this part of the world. And I think that America is looking to India to be its close ally in that regard. I mean, the whole nuclear treaty is an example of how the United States looks at India. I think we feel that we have a special relationship there. But basically, my bottom line point is that there is a creeping isolationist attitude developing in the United States because people feel that we need to address our problems at home. And if you watch the president, you can see how he's very reluctant. And whenever there's an action someplace, he wants to bring in the allies. You know, we'll do things like, for example, you know, refuel your planes in the air, or we'll let you uh, use our technology. But in terms of putting people on the ground, there, there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a tendency to, to not do that anymore. For, until we can address our problems, the ones that you point out in your book. Yeah, I, I would agree, definitely. I mean, I moved back to, after more than a decade in China, I moved back to a small town in America in southwestern Colorado. And when I, go, when I would go to a bar or someplace and meet somebody and, and, they, and I tell them that I had spent the last decade in China, that all, invariably the question was always, were you in the military? Um, you know, which is like, I think the image was that there's a massive marine base in the Forbidden City, you know, which is, you know, definitely not, this China is not where you go if you're in the military, but that's what the, that's the only reason you go overseas. Um, that's a problem, you know, and I, and I think it's, I'm very concerned that, I mean, of course, I think we have learned a lesson from these wars, but the problem is if the lesson is just stay away, you know, and I think the real, another thing you really noticed in China, I mean, I taught English there originally, and, and then I became a writer, and there was this incredible interest in the outside world and an incredible drive to learn English, for example. And you see this in India, I see it in Egypt, and it's because people see it as an opportunity. And I think somehow Americans need to, to have this mindset, but it's very hard because they see the outside world more as a threat than as an opportunity. And so after 9-11, there's all this talk, we need to learn Arabic, we need to learn Arabic so that people don't attack us. You know, but you don't learn, anybody who's taught, you don't learn a language or anything out of fear. You know, you learn it out of self-interest and out of, you know, out of, uh, you know, something positive. You see it as, and so there aren't many Americans who've learned Arabic, you know, did, dur during that period. Because you need, you need a sense that it's going to improve your life somehow. It's sort of a pity that we all agree with each other, because I feel a sort of boredom descending on the, on the hall. But, so perhaps you could come up, try and come up with a point that will cause a quarrel. But I think two other problems from the consequences of the fear in 9-11. One is that one of the great things about America when you used to go there is that it was not a country of what the French called petite fonctionnaire, the little officious officials who would boss you around all the time. So the obsession with security has created a society of petite fonctionnaire. Everybody from doormen to air hostesses are now bossing you around. Uh, and, and imposing rules and so on uh, because of, of security, which is, is a bad thing. The other thing I think is that it has, and again, there's maybe a parallel a little bit with, with British history, is that it's militarized society to a degree that uh, in Europe would be unthinkable. I mean, the, every politician has to constantly refer to our heroes in uniform, bless our boys in uniform. I remember there was a spread in the New York Times magazine 
of men and women in uniform, uh, almost like sort of fashion plates. So this, was a, this was presented in the New York Times magazine as something that was cool. And um, I don't think that that's very good for a society uh, either. Do, do, you, do you see um, this isolationism descending a lot, uh, um, upon the American populace? And does that worry you, given what you said about the need for American presence in this region especially? No, but I, I, unfortunately, um, I, I agree with what Peter said. I, I think it's, it's, it's this fear factor that uh, the outside world is seen as a source of, of danger and something to engage with in the military and so on, but not as in the days of, say, JFK, that uh, most, a lot of young people wanted to be in the Peace Corps, and if they weren't in the Peace Corps, they were hippies, and they wanted to go to India and get stoned, or they wanted to do something, but at least get out of the United States and learn about the world. And uh, the militarization of, of the mentality of America has meant that now it, it is the, our heroes in uniform who seem to be uh, the main representatives of the United States in the outside world. We'll go to uh, questions from the audience in just a second, but one last question for Ed before we do that. Despite all of, all of your pessimism, your skepticism that America can, can manage to tackle these problems in a serious way anytime soon, you say that if you were fleeing oppression, you were fleeing poverty in some other part of the world, you would still choose to go to America if you could choose to go to any place uh, in the world. Why, why is that still true despite all of these problems? Uh, I, I would um, seek asylum first at the American embassy if I was in, in trouble living in an autocratic country, yes. Um, I don't think there's any sort of inconsistency between America remaining a relatively open society, slightly less open, less welcoming, well, a lot less welcoming than it used to be. And it being uh, the largest Western open society. It's not going to cease to be the largest. It's going to remain first among, amongst equals. Uh, the problem, my pessimism is because the problems we're talking about, educational decline. I mean, the, the fact that Americans come 30th in, in mathematics, 30th in English um, and, and, and science. Um, these are long-term, slow-burning fuses. They're not shocks that are forcing action now. They're the frog in boiling water syndrome. Um, uh, and so, you know, if, if you did have riots in the streets, if you had had a really serious Occupy Wall Street sort of moment rather than a fleeting one um, that had forced a, a, a real thoroughgoing change in, in self-examination, I would actually be more, paradoxically, I'd be more optimistic. I am, though, I do agree with Ian on one thing. I was hoping everybody was going to attack me and try and, you know, kick me to pieces. Uh, I'm d disturbed everybody's agreeing with me. We'll have to go to the audience. Yeah, well, there's an audience. Sorry. Yeah. You, you can all disagree um, with me. We've got about 20 minutes for questions. Please be uh, relatively brief and ask a question and quickly identify yourself. Uh, so let's go um, with the right here on the aisle. Hi. Hi. My name is Blethi. Please, um, please stand as well. Uh, in a sense, I mean, how, how far can you claim this decline of America is uh, debatable given that America has been running a deficit since the 70s, so effectively being subsidized by the rest of the world? and the consumer society doesn't really save. And militarily, since the 1970s, America has not been able to exert its will anymore. So really, the real decline that's left now is America's reputation. And the last dozen years have been very difficult for anybody who admires America to actually look America in, in the face. But I, mean, I think any, but any of us could answer, but um, uh, the, the, the triple, what I like to call a triple cocktail, Middle class income stagnation. It's, like, it's called stagnation. Medium income stagnation is actually de decline. Uh, declining mobility and rising inequality is creating a sort of Latin American feel in the United States. The strongest year of growth since 2009 was in 2010. It was 3%. Um, in that year, 93% of growth went to the top 1% of Americans. 40% of growth went to the top 0.01% percent of Americans. That's 15 percent of families. Structurally, it gets worse each time. So widening inequality is make, giving America a Latin American feel. And the thing about Latin American politics um, is that because there's such gross inequality of income, it tends to lurch from populism to uh, orthodoxy and back again in great destabilizing swings that make sensible governance, that make sensible politics very, very difficult. The irony of all of this is that large chunks of Latin America are becoming much less Latin American as time goes on. They're getting majority middle class. Mexico is one of them. Brazil, 
although it's slowed recently, is another. And that really is my core problem. I, I used the quote at the beginning of the book um, from de Tocqueville, the greatest observer of Amer foreign observer of America, that uh, America's um, greatness is, is not that she's better than all the others, it's in her ability to repair her faults. And it's the loss or the decline in that ability that most disturbs me. And I think that's become particularly vivid in the last 12 years. Peter? Just, oh, we're not, just quickly, I mean, we talk about the, you mentioned the, the ability to repair the faults. I mean, one thing that I think is important for the image of America, you know, most people outside of America were very disappointed with the presidency of George W. Bush, and that was followed by the election of Barack Hussein Obama. And I think that does mean a lot to, to the outside world. I think when they see a president who is so different, his background is so totally different, and it's so international, that's important, you know, and I think sometimes we've lost sight of that in these other crises, and, and you know, I, I hear from a lot of people in Cairo who just, in, basically, there's a very troubled view of America there, but a lot of people continue to be positive about Obama because they see him as having real links to the region and, and, and to, you know, maybe their religion or, or to, to cultural elements that are not always associated with America, and it gives people a broader view of the, of the country. I just wanted to respond to uh, comments made by this uh, gentleman. Uh, let me talk about two areas where we have lost ground and which cause great concern. One is on education, the other one is on the financial side. Now with education, what you have seen is that the incredible public school system that we've had in America, which has produced a lot of Nobel laureates and opened up a lot of opportunities for a lot of people, has been in decline. And I think that started many, many years ago when people started moving out of the cities and they started moving to the suburbs. And I think that what happened, I grew up in Washington, D.C. We had some of the best public schools you could find anywhere. When people started moving out to Virginia and all those places, the good teachers followed them. So you ended up getting teachers in the public school system who perhaps were not at the top. So the kids who lived in the cities who tended to be more and more minorities had teachers who were not the top flight teachers because they had fled. And that, that's something that's, that happened over a long period of time. So right now we're in a situation where the public schools are terrible. Now, people are beginning to move back to the cities because there's a lot of conveniences of living in the cities. And I think that could have a change, but it will take time for that change. The second change is the financial crisis that we have. Uh, as you may know that when Bill Clinton left office, we had a budget surplus. America was strong financially. Now we have a huge budget deficit. Now, we have to admit that part of that was caused by the wars that we've been fighting over the last 14 years, trillions of dollars. And this is why I say that getting out of those wars will begin to have a positive impact on our balance sheet because we won't have to borrow so much. And if we can stop the, if we can, if we can not have to borrow for wars, and if Washington can demonstrate that it's committed to making some of these structural changes in education, infrastructure, what you will see is that the private sector will then come to the fore. We haven't talked about the private sector here. America is about our private sector. Right now, they are very reluctant to hire people. They're very reluctant to invest money uh, in, in capital equipment because they don't know what's going to happen because of this gridlock in Washington. This gridlock is having a very, very negative impact on the business sector. But once we unlock that, that American private sector, I think, again, that will have a positive impact because their profits will go up, taxes will go up. So that over the next five or six years or so, if we can get through this short-term gridlock that we have in Washington, I'm optimistic about the Americans' financial situation. And if we can stay out of any more wars, that would be a great thing, too. Let's go to the back of the hall. Um, so a man in a blue shirt, very, very back. Hi. I just want to ask you, uh, you're saying that uh, if uh, you want to get out of the wars because it helps you economically, is that the only reason? Or <laughs> would you like to stay in the wars if you're doing well? Absolutely. I, I don't know any. any anyone? I, I think he's. I think he's looking at me. <laughs> um, well, no. War is bad. 
you want to avoid war at all costs. I'll just make that definitive statement. Uh, we'll, we'll go to the front here, uh, red shirt. Right. Hello. I had two questions. One was about um, what we've been discussing in terms of fear. And um, with the death of Aaron Schwartz, you know, who was one of the most profound, intelligent internet activists to have come out of the US, which is being blamed on the kind of, you know, federal bullying that went on, I think there is also a lot of fear within the US of people who are really trying to work to change the system. And I think there's, and so, you know, comment on that, people. Um, you know, what we saw with WikiLeaks and the kind of crackdown that came on people after WikiLeaks, it's not just fear of the outside. There are also people within the U.S. who are really trying to work to change the system, and the government hasn't acted very kindly towards them. So one, could you comment on that? And secondly, when it comes to the paralysis of the government, um, you know, having studied in the U.S. and focused on the issue of institutional um, corruption and campaign financing, you know, the fact is, whether you're looking at Democrat or Republicans, there was a recent news report that showed senators are now spending four to six hours of their days calling funders. How are they going to solve the problems of America if they're spending all their time raising money? And you have, you know, the issue of super PACs. So these two issues, which I think are very relevant to the core of the decline of America, could you please comment on those? Ian, do you want to address fear? Well, I, I mean, on the second question, yes, I, there's not much, I don't think any of us would dissent. I mean, if, and it's, this is, was opened up by a decision of the Supreme Court, and far too much money is spent on elections. I mean, that's clearly true. Um, the first part of, the, part of your question, I don't know if it's true to say that the U.S. has a kind of overbearing state that's oppressing dissent, uh, certainly not more than anywhere else in, in the democratic world. After all, um, Julian Assange, um, everybody was trying to get him, uh, including the Swedes. So, uh, but it is true that there, one of the, the odd things during the Iraq war was the absence of a protest culture. But there were protesters uh, and there were demonstrations and so on, but there wasn't really a culture. There were no great protest songs. There was no Bob Dylan. Um, I went to see a, a demonstration in, in the middle of New York on Washington Square, and they were playing old John Lennon songs because the, the whole generation had gone by without really um, uh, being politically engaged. And I think it, it seemed to be changing in 2008 with the election, the first uh, election of Barack Obama, which did engage young people. And then again it came alive in, in the Occupy Wall Street um, uh, period. But it's got a way to go, but I don't think that's be because the state has been oppressive. I think there has been a genuine, ge general indifference uh, to politics amongst a lot of young people in, in the United States for whatever reason. Point of optimism, just quick optimism. A hundred, hundred people um, in the last election, uh, the hundred richest people who are contributing through super PACs, Sheldon Adelson, people like that, he spent $75 million. Generally, the super PAC spending was for Romney, and they did lose. So, money isn't everything. Um, let's go uh, to a w woman in orange shirt, I believe. Someone in orange shirt on the aisle right there, in the middle. Uh, my name's uh, Ranjan Bal. Um, Ed, a few years ago, when you were here, you wrote a really uh, insightful and interesting book on India as uh, FT Bureau Chief. And now you've done the same thing in the US. I guess the only thing you miss is the cricket. But um, I was just struck by your emphasis on the policy paralysis in Washington, the lack of governance, the fact that two uh, parties, major parties, don't talk to each other, and the point that Frank Savage made, which is that the private sector, on the back of that, is just refusing to invest. That is a complete parallel to what's happening here in India. So I'd be interested in your comments on that, actually, and you know, if you have the degree of optimism for either, either which country are you more optimistic about? I, I, I can pledge one thing. When I write my next book, it's not going to be about whether a country is going up or down. <laughs> although, 
Maldives sort of sideways might be, might be a, a nice year or two of my... Um, that's a very good question. There are a lot of parallels in terms of um, the, uh, the, the, the governance question being at the core of the future of India. That's the sort of big question mark everybody has about India. And it's the big question mark everybody has about the United States. Again, to sort of find myself in the odd position of being the optimist. Um, there's, uh, if anybody hasn't seen it, there's this brilliant drama, um, d uh, American drama called Boardwalk Empire, which is about New Jersey run by the Irish Mafia as a sort of criminalized arm of politics. Uh, I mean, uh, politics being an arm of the criminal world. And then New York uh, under the Mafia there in Chicago, a, a young Al Capone. And it made me think of Bihar and places like that and UP. Um, and the fact that if America was able to rise through these sort of brash, new, ethnic, criminalized, kleptocratic groups, um, that India shouldn't feel as bleak as it, it is feeling. Um, but I, you know, I have no magic bullet. As Americans say, I have no Hail Mary answer to these governance questions. They're deeply rooted. Um, the, the rhetoric in India and in the United States tends to sort of take on a moral tone, that you get these politicians, they're low characters, they go to Delhi, they go to Washington, and somehow they traduce the rest of us. If only it were that simple. Um, actually, they represent us. They're, they're us in the mirror. Um, and, and they come from the sociological complexities beyond the Beltway and beyond New Delhi. And I'm afraid I don't have a magic solution um, to these very, very profound and central governance questions. Uh, f front here, right there. Let's wait for a mic. Don't you think the fear is the main problem of America? By this fear, the moment of terrorism of 9-11. Don't you think this is the time to forget the 9-11 and go further? Because of the moments of 9-11, America created terrorism in lots of countries like Pakistan. The president of Tehrike Taliban in Pakistan, Imran Khan, said that 95% of terrorism in Pakistan is created by America movement in pa Pakistan. Don't you think it's a time to go further and stop this thing? I mean, I, th I think we've discussed fear at great length. Do you see, I mean, a, a lot of people would argue that this second Obama administration, the U.S. foreign policy is moving beyond that post-9-11 era with John Kerry and Chuck Hagel, who focus on a very different set of issues. Ed, do you agree that we've uh, turned a corner in our foreign policy and are kind of entering a different, a different period than we were in? To some, to some extent. I mean, one of the interesting, I mean, Obama killed bin Laden as, as, as Joe Biden as Joe Biden mentioned, you know, he saved General Motors, saved Detroit, and killed Bin Laden, and that was a pretty sort of killer single sentence for the for the election in November. But one of the, you know, Obama's a complex person, and one of the, the interesting things about him is the continuity with George W. Bush in terms of the war on terror. And, you know, a facet of this fear of American engagement overseas is to now do it by remote control. The drone program is being stepped up. Um, and it, as you point out, it, 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 causes, it causes a great deal of resentment. There's a lot of civilians who get killed. They probably create more terrorists than drone pro programs kill. I understand why Obama has moved to drones, um, but uh, it's not a long-term solution, and others are developing drones. Uh, it's not an American monopoly for long. I, I would just add to that that even that has been seen by some uh, friends of America as, as a kind of model. I was reading an article in India today by Veer Sanghvi uh, in which he said that um, the Obama um, use of drones is the way for India to go. P Peter, how does this look sitting in, in Cairo? Well, I think one other element of this is, you know, the culture of fear. So, I mean, it, it is depressing to go to a U.S. embassy almost anywhere because they look like either prisons or military encampments, and certainly in Cairo it's like that. And the, you know, the the killing of the ambassador in Libya in, in Benghazi um, is sort of creating a, yeah, a, you know, a wave of, of fear about this sort of thing. And I think that's a problem, though, the way the Foreign Service has to be isolated overseas, um, the sense that there can be no risk to them. I mean, I, I was in the Peace Corps in China, and there's a lot of Peace Corps volunteers who get hurt and who, 
you know, who die, not a lot, but I mean, it happens, um, because they're engaging with the culture that they're in, and they're out, and, and things happen, and it, there seems to be no tolerance for this among the Foreign Service, and, and I think as a result, the information that they get is not that good. They don't really get the texture of the country that they're in, and they also have to move around so frequently. Most of them don't want to live this way, you know, and, and so I think that's, that's something that I really notice being overseas, is, I mean, you know, I live next to one of the compounds in, in, in Cairo for a period, um, which was in downtown Cairo, where they had Americans who, who, you know, at the embassy were living there, and it had big walls, of course, and guards. But I, the one thing I noticed, I never saw the people who lived there walking around talking to people, you know. And I mean, I was living in an apartment, and the first thing I did is make sure everybody knows me. They see me with my two small daughters. These, uh, there's guys with guns who guard the area. Make sure those guys know my name, you know, who I am, because this is my community, you know, and, and that's part of what it takes to be secure. This is, I don't have a a bodyguard. I don't have people protecting me, you know, but if you know the locals and you speak the language and you talk with them, which is, you know, then that's part of the project. And I think Americans don't recognize this right now, you know, the, how important that is. You see it in the CIA. I mean, in this country, the CIA was always seen as this super powerful organization that was really ruling the world all the time because they were so brilliant and powerful. I'm sorry? But... But the CIA has really changed. That, that I was reading a story about uh, an Indian American who wanted to be in the CIA, he was a patriot, and who was talking to his mother on the telephone in Urdu, and they decided he wasn't for them, that was too dangerous. So it's now full of Mormons who are trained in, in Utah to learn Korean and go on missionary work in South Korea. So all they know is Utah and South Korea. And these are not the people who are going to get the flavor of the country they're posted in. I just want to pick up on something that Ed said. Ed said that Obama is a complex person. And I think that's really probably an understatement. And it's going to be interesting to see how history treats Barack Obama as they look back on his first term and his second term. In the first term, I think that Barack, in a way, was trying to prove something to people who thought that he shouldn't be in the office so that why did he continue to support the wars? I think he felt that he dare not stop that movement because there would be such an uproar about it. Uh, and I think that there were several other things like that where he was basically trying to prove to the American people that he could actually govern the country. I think that in his second term, he's much more confident. He doesn't have to run for re-election. He can really do the things that he really believes in. And at his core, Barack Obama is a person who believes in taking care of people. That's his background. That's what he was doing in Chicago. I mean, that's the kind of man that he is. But he had to show his detractors that he was able to govern and make some of the tough decisions that he had to make. But I'm hoping that in this second term that he's going to, as I said earlier, he's going to say, okay, we have to be tough now. We have to solve these problems or else I'll leave and there'll be no legacy for me. I will not have solved some of these deep underlying problems. We've got time for a couple more questions. We'll take two and then the, the, the panel can respond. So make them good and very short. And all four of these guys will be signing books afterwards. So you can, um, those of you who have not had a chance to ask questions can, can go ahead and do so afterwards. Let's go with uh, the person on the aisle right there, um, followed by the man in the front. Okay. Uh, this is from Delhi. Ed, my question is to you. Uh, so from what I can gather from what you said, the two-party system in the US is perhaps right now in a gridlock. And we in India, are, a lot of us actually believe that perhaps a two-party system, a magic bullet to what we call a policy paralysis precipitated by a multi-party system in India. So what do you think has gone wrong in the US? Or is the efficacy of a two-party system just a fallacy? And let's take the, si the second question right now. My question is, the, uh, do the panel think, does anyone in the panel think that the United States is more ready now, or, or is the Middle East one of the pivotal issues for the foreign policy to be involved? What, what is the role of the, the resurgence of the United States? That, um, so that, yeah, the, the, the first question. Um, it, there's something in, in Washington called Parliament Envy, um, which is envying a majoritarian system, you know, where the legislature and the executive are merged. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm from Britain, and uh, Britain, uh, you know, supposedly got its decline out of the way before I was born. 
but actually it's got a whole new lease of life um, at the moment, and that is with a parliamentary decisive executive system. If you look at Britain and America in the last four years and their responses to the Great Recession, um, America has grown, not very much, it's been very anemic. Britain's economy is the same size today as it was in 2006, so what I say to my American friends is, with their, with their, I must perhaps say penis envy, their parliament envy is be careful what you wish for. Um, it, 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 the grass is always greener on the other side. I don't know whether others want to ask the Middle East, answer the Middle East question, but just one very quick point is the pivot to Asia that Obama has um, embarked upon um, is very much contingent on the Middle East not interrupting it. And a war with Iran um, would destroy all other diplomatic strategies that are underway. So I think that's the thing to be watching. Uh, we've got a cut off from getting signals from the organizers. So um, please give a round of applause to the panel and you can uh, press them over a book signing. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being a wonderful audience. All the four authors will be available.